Hi guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Lone Vic and I'm here with another how to play video. Today we are playing Hadrian's Wall. This is the Polish name for this game because I've got the Polish edition and I will be teaching you how to set it up and play for a different player count. This is a um, resource collection and write game for one to six players and uh, don't worry I'll be using the English nomenclature for all those explanations so you should be able to uh, find everything perfectly. This is a pretty short game, so let's get right into it. If you like this video, if you like the other videos on my channel, please remember to click some likes, hit the subscribe button, click the notification bell to be notified about new videos that are upcoming on my channel. This helps me out immensely and it's just one second of time for you, so I would deeply appreciate it. And now let's take a look at how to set up Hadrian's Wall. Okay, so this is the general setup. We need a player board for each player. I'm setting up a single player game, but it doesn't really matter, so because the differences are very minimal, and I'll be talking you through all of those. So you have to take one player board for each player. Each player should get a set of 12 cards with commanders, and those cards uh, are in different colors. I took green for myself, and you've got uh, orange and others in the box. Shuffle them place them somewhere next to the board so that they're easily accessible. You should take also the deck of Barbarian cards, and there are quite a lot of them. Also shuffle them and place them somewhere nearby. Take all of the resources that are provided with the game. Those are the wooden meeples and the resource bricks, maybe, let's call them, stone, rock, or whatever. In the rulebook, these are, these are called resources, the black ones are soldiers, the blue ones are builders, the purple ones are servants, and the yellow ones are civilians. So you should have all of those nearby. Last but not least, give each player a sheet, or two sheets to be honest, that are provided with the game, and a pen to write with. And this is it. The setup is now complete. So now let's take a look at how to play this game. Okay, here we are, ladies and gentlemen. So I've placed the resources off the screen. You, you can't see them, but I'll be taking them from there. Trust me, they're uh, north of the board here. And all of the other decks are nearby. So there are a lot of areas that you will need to complete during the game in order to win. The game is played over a course of six turns and later the player who has the most points at the end of those six turns is the winner. So how do we play the game? First, it, during each turn you must uncover the first barbarian card from the top and this will tell you how many resources are placed on each player's individual board. So in this case I should place one soldier, I should place two builders, I should place two priests, or uh, sorry, two servants, one civilian, and two resources, two stone. And this is it. And I should leave this card uncovered somewhere, so I will just leave it here for now. The rest of those symbols doesn't matter at this moment. Now, here in the resource production line, you would get one resource for each blanked uh, out space and you have bl one blanked out already so you get one additional resource as well and this is it for the beginning of the game after that each player draws the two top cards from their own deck and takes a look at those now these cards have a lot of different symbols here but we are worried only about the top and the left bottom corner so the top ones are conditions, vic conditions for gaining victory points at the end of the game. In my case, I've got finished wall guard sections, for example, or collected goods from the market. And right now I have to select one of those cards to put here so that the victory goal for the end of the game is going to be scored and the other card will provide me with the resource in the bottom left corner as well as I will have these symbols available for the game. So I will choose the finished wall guard sections for uh, my goal, for my goal in the first year and I will place this near my board and I will take one civilian 
as this card shows, and I will take one resource. Okay, and after each player has done that, we can start the game. There is a little caveat though, if you are playing a two-player game, you should have one deck nearby, which will be a um, kind of neutral deck, and each turn you draw one card from this deck and you don't do anything with it, you just place it somewhere nearby so that it's available. Because even if you are playing a two-player game, you should have three sources of those symbols available from the two players and from the neutral deck. And if you are playing a solo game, you would take two cards from this deck and make them available for you because you still need three sources of those symbols. So in my one-player game, I should have to put one, two cards from this deck into play for later on. But in more, when you're playing with more players, each player will have their own card here and that's enough. Okay, so now let's go one by one through those tracks and those places and those symbols on those uh, sheets that you can blank out, that you can cross out in order to win the game. Let's start with the left hand side. On the left hand side you have cohorts and those cohorts are things that defend you from picked invasions at the end of each turn, at the end of each year. And you will be filling in one square every single time you see this symbol filled in on your, uh, on your sheet. And sometimes you will score additional points, like for example here you will be able to score one on the discipline track and if you fill in this finally you will be able to score one on the valor track as well and fill this space in. Remember that most of those spaces that are horizontal and are in lines are tracks and you have to fill them from the left. So here this is the first field, this is the first field and this is the first field and you go from here to the left when you are filling those in. And each cohort is responsible for defending a different wall section. The left section is here, the middle section is here, the right section is here. You will see later why we need those three. So this is pretty straightforward. Watch out for this shield symbol everywhere. Then we've got the forest and the mines uh, row. And this one we fill in from left to right as well, and when once you fill in this, you get one resource and you get one resource production to fill in over here. And remember from the beginning of the video, the more blanked out fields you have here, the more resources you get at the beginning of every year. So for example, I could spend one purple guy, because there is a purple uh, servant Mimi here, and I could fill in this, and if I spent another one, I could fill in this. And this would give me one resource and I could blank out one resource production like so. The next area is the guard or the wall guard. And this has a sword icon and a soldier icon. So anytime you spend a soldier or you blank out a sword icon, you can blank out spaces from the left to the right on the wall guard. And these, as you can see, give you cohorts and these give you discipline usually. So this row at the bottom here and filling in the cohorts here. Next we have the Sipi or Kipi. I have no idea how to pronounce this. And this and this section, which is the wall itself, is connected to the fort. So let's start with the fort. Now here you spend builders or soldiers to fill in these spaces and sometimes this will grant you a civilian uh, meeple or for example uh, discipline or sometimes even a cohort and you will have those flags with infrastructure levels on, uh, on the way and we'll talk about those flags later on. But as you fill this you can see that each of these fields at the bottom is chained to one of the fields in the wall or in the CP. So you cannot fill in any of those chained fields until you have the fort filled in first. So I would have to, for example, spend one uh, builder to fill in this first, and only then I would be able to spend one brick or one resource to fill in this wall fragment, which would give me a civilian token because I filled in this yellow one. And also I could spend one 
uh, resource to fill in this CP fragment, which gives me nothing, but can later allow me to fill in this. Remember that this is a separate track and this is a separate track and you always fill them from left to right. So if I got here, for example, I would be able to fill this automatically with one resource. So CP costs one resource, wall costs one resource, fort costs either a builder or a soldier, and you always do them from left to right. Now, there are also three granaries here below the fort, and the first granary, which is called a small granary, is already built. Now, the medium granary costs you one servant and one builder and one resource, and you will be able to fill in this space, and the large granary costs you two, raw, two resources and one builder and one servant, and you can fill this in and also receive one healed on the Renown track, which is the yellow track here. Why are those granaries important? Because unless you have this granary built, the middle one, you cannot cross into this middle section of the fort or the wall or the city or the wall guard or the mines and forests. You just can't. So this enables you to get into this middle section. This doesn't relate to the uh, cohorts. You can see those brighter lines that separate these areas. So again, with the large granary, this will allow you to get into this section to finish off the wall and the guards and everything like that. So this is what you have to have built first. And you can see those orange flags here, which this one has one and this one has five here. You cannot build a medium granary until you have this flag with number one marked out in your fort like I have right now. And you can't build the large granary until you reach level five here. So this is connected. Complicated enough, you say. This is only the beginning. Let's take a look here right now. You know this track already. This is the pro resource production. So each blanked out space gives you one uh, resource at the beginning of each year. Now this is the training ground and this has a hashtag here and every time you see a hashtag you need to put a number here. So whenever you spend a builder you can change the builder into a sword icon which can advance you on the wall guard track but you have to enter the number of the year in which you are doing it because you can do this training of a uh, builder into a wall guard only maximum once a year. So this number will be telling you if you have done it this year or not. So if I wanted to do this, I would have to spend one builder. I would have to mark this, enter one because this is year one, and I could blank out here on the wall guard the first area which gives me one cohort advancement and I could mark for example this cohort defending the middle section of the wall. This is how it goes. And then we have something called the hotel, the workshop and the road. So these have limitations when it comes to those flags so you cannot build any of those buildings until you reach the appropriate flag the second one the third one the fourth one the sixth one seventh and eighth one and you have the prices here so one servant one builder and one resource or three resources or two servants one builder and one resource and the rewards you mark this plus this so you always get this as uh, information that the building is already built and this is your reward so you take both of those here you have advancements on the piety and the uh, discipline track and here on the renown and valor track for example now those buildings give you one-time rewards but also each year at the start of the year after you collect your resources you will get one civilian for each hotel built so for each blanked out space as you can see, similar to this resource production track, you will get one builder for each of those two buildings and you will get one advancement on any of the four tracks for each of the buildings built here, for each of the roads. So this gives you permanent bonuses at the beginning of every year. You also have the forum which allows you to trade two meeples of any kind for a single meeple of a different color, but it cannot be a soldier. And similarly to the barracks or the uh, 
uh, training grounds, as they are called, you can do it only once a year, so you have to put the number here uh, of the year in which you did this. So this is something that can save you if you uh, have too many um, resources of one type. Then you have landmarks, as they are called in English, and you have four of those, and these can be built for one builder and two resources each, and they give you two advancements on a given track, but they have an additional requirement. In order to build this uh, landmark, which is a gate, you can see here the symbol of the renowned track and this uh, icon here. This refers to this flag, which is on the 15th victory point. So in order to be able to build this building, you have to have 15 renown. As soon as you get 15 renown, you can spend this and this to build this building, cross this out and get two valor. Similarly with the monolith and the column and the statue. So this is related to this track. And those four tracks, renown, piety, valor and discipline, you just advance in them, you get the bonuses which you mark when you mark them and these give you victory points at the end of the game and that's it. At the bottom here you have something called disdain Disdain, in this case, is marked here in these areas. So whenever you get a disdain, and I will tell you how to do it later, you have to circle this one of those areas. Don't fill it in, just circle it. Circled areas means that you get disdain, and if you fill it in, that means that you have removed it. Right. So this will be connected with the wall defense at the end of the year. And here you've got areas for scoring victory points at the end of the game, so we'll leave them at that right now. So this is this whole sheet already explained, and this is only half of the game. We still have this to cover. So here, guys, we've got five types of citizens and their citizen tracks. We've got the traders, we've got the artists, we've got the priests, we've got the apparitors, and we've got the patricians. And each of those tracks can be advanced either using a civilian yellow meeple, so you start from the left again and you can advance those and get the rewards that you can see in those tracks, this is pretty obvious, or sometimes you will be advancing them because you've covered or marked this icon that's connected with the uh, specific type of civilians, like for example here if you mark this you will get this icon that's referred to traders and you'll be able to mark one on this track. And now why are those tracks important? He, here we have buildings that are special, unique to each type of civilians. We've got the precincts and the market for the traders and you can build a small precinct only when you reach number three on the traders track. So this flag informs you about that. And once you reach three, you can spend these two resources. So this is a, a servant and a civilian to mark all of this. So get one on the piety track here, one resource production and one resource. And similarly with those, but with level six and nine on this track, this unlocks those building opportunities. And you have the market. It requires level four on the trader track. You have to build it later for those resources and you will score one renown. And this makes these actions available. Now, what do they do? These also refer to the level of the trader track. So you have to have those levels reached in order to be using those fields. But once you have, you can spend one resource in order to gather one trade good. And what do you do then? Now, a trade good can be gathered from any neighboring player's cards and you look at the bottom right corner of those cards and those trade goods have numbers, like for example one or two. And if you take a resource, a trade good, from any other player, you have to give them the resource that you are paying with. And if you don't want to give it to any other players or the number it isn't really to your liking, you can always draw one card from the top of the Barbarian deck and take the number that's on the card and then you spend the resource into the pile. Once you get this resource number, you put it into the action that you've used to buy the trade good, sorry, not resource, but trade good, and for every first, second and third number that doesn't, unique number, so a number that you don't already have, you get one renown. For every fourth and fifth number that you don't yet have, you get two renown and the last unique number here gives you three renown. And these two areas also give you a servant and a builder if you 
fill them in, but they are the last on the track, so they are the most expensive to grab. Now, for a one or two player game, there is one small difference that if you are not using the random trade good, but you are using one of those from these two cards that you've uh, uncovered for a one player game or the one card that you added for a two player game, you place the resource that you paid with here when you are collecting this trade good and these resources will be needed later on. So we'll get back to that. So this is the trade and the market and everything. And so now the artist, the theater and the ludus gladiatorius. Artists, again, you advance these and you can build a theater when you have the first level of artists, you build it for one servant, one builder and one resource, you mark this, get one renown. And then once per year, you have a hashtag to enter these numbers here, remember, like with the training grounds and with the forum, you can perform a play in the theater. This costs you one resource, it has a level requirement as well, and it gives you some advancements. You don't have to go one by one. You can, for example, if you have nine on this track, you can launch this play automatically, skipping all the others. It doesn't really, this is not a track. You can choose whichever you want. Now, the Ludus Gladiatorius is more interesting in the fact that when you reach level three, you can build it for two servants, one builder and two resource and get one renown. And later, when you have three, four, five, six, eight or nine level, you can increase the strength of your gladiators by paying one servant or one civilian per red or blue gladiator. And now when you increase the strength of the gladiator, you just circle the guy by paying, for example, one yellow, if I already had this built, right? But I don't, so this is a hypothetical. You circle it to mark that the red gladiator now has one strength or two or three or four. And then the same for the blue one. And once per year, each gladiator can fight. And if you decide to fight with the gladiator, you decide which one is fighting. So for example, the red one, and you uncover the top card of the barbarian deck. And it shows you that the gladiator is, who is fighting got three uh, wounds. And wounds are marked like so, but they are marked only up to the strength of the gladiator. So for example, I got three wounds, I would mark this one right now because uh, I have only one strength and the gladiator is dead and you can later uh, you know buy more strength to get the gladiator up. You insert the number of the year in which he was fighting here to remember that he was fighting and if the gladiator died with one strength you get two, uh, two piety. With two strengths two piety again. With three strengths so the last wound is here you get this, and if the last wound is here, you get this, and if the last wound is here or here, you get nothing. But if he won, so there is at least one strength left over after the fight, you look at where the last strength is, and if the last strength is here, you get one renown. If the last strength that is not filled in is here, you get two renown, and so forth and so on. And you can do this for both gladiators every year. Now let's go on to the priests. And again, on this track, you fulfill the conditions for building these temples and gardens. So gardens at level four and level seven, you build them and you just get those resources here. So these can give you, for example, one piety on this track, but they also give you one trader level, one artist level and one priest level. And this gives you even more. But with temples, the situation is a bit different. Now, temples on level one, level three and level six, can be built for piety, scored, and then you can spend any one uh, meeple to fill in this space, and then the next time you spend the meeple, you, for example, spend this space, and uh, fill this space, which gives you one piety and allows you to circle this symbol, which allows you to ignore one of the Pict's attack cards of your choice. And we will get to that later. I will leave that circled for a hypothetical later on. You have to complete the small temple before you can complete the uh, fields in the uh, me medium temple and then the large temple. You can have them built, but you can't, uh, you have to do those fields one by one. And then we've got the apparitors. And again, they can build buffs and they can build the court. 
those are the two buildings for them, or the courthouse, level 3, level 4. I won't be talking about the requirements and the effects because you've already figured that out, hopefully. Now, when you build the baths, you can, on a certain level, and only once per year again, you've got uh, maximum two bribes per year can be given, so you can insert the same two numbers here. You can pay resources in order to fill in those open disdain sections in order to cancel them. So these thumbs up remove disdain if you purchase those, and you can do this twice a year. And now here in the court, you can play each column once a year, and this gives you an effect. For example, if you play this column, you just get a servant. If you play this column, you have to pay one builder to get two servants, and here you can pay one servant for one builder. You can choose whichever fields from the columns you want, but you have to have the level filled on the um, civilian track, and remember one decision from a court per column per year. The last guys are the patricians, and the patricians can send diplomats on level 1, 3, and 6. They have to pay one soldier, one servant, and two resources for each of those, and each dipl diplomat gives you one valor on the valor track and enables you to circle these two symbols for cancelling cards from the picked attacks, but you have to choose which cohort, left, center, or right, will those symbols match. These symbols from the temple can be used for any cards, and these have directions. And you cannot have two identical directions, so each diplomat has to be connected with a different wall section. But they give very good protection. And lastly, we've got the scouts. And the scouts are on level 2, 4, 5, 7, and 9. You have to pay one soldier for those in order to blank out this space. And what does that mean is that if you spend the soldier into the resource, you take the symbol from your card and you can put it here into this uh, space whenever you want. And any symbols you cover, this is what you get for the resources. If you are using the uh, other cards in a one-player game, the additional card in a two-player game, or if you are using the symbols from cards of your opponents, you have to spend the uh, soldier that you are using onto those cards or give them to the owners of those cards so that they can use them and you can use those symbols. You can rotate those symbols and flip them any way you want. But what is important is that for every horizontal line that you fill in in this grid, you also get one valor. Okay, so this is it. And now the play can go simultaneously for all players until everybody is out of resources or out of moves. And after this happens for all players, the Picts attack. Now let's talk about the attack of the Picts. Every year the Picts will attack decided depending on the level of difficulty you want to play the game with. There is the green easiest level of difficulty, the yellow medium, and the red hardest level of difficulty. You decide on the level of difficulty before the beginning of the game, and you draw this amount of cards that's shown on the back of the flag with the level of difficulty. So in the first year on the easy difficulty you draw one card from the Picts attack, on the second year two, three, four, six, and eight. But for the harder difficulty, for example, it'll be one, three, five, seven, nine, and twelve. And once you draw the card, for example, one for the first year, you take a look at which direction do the Picts attack. So it's the left section of the wall, the middle section of the wall, or the right section of the wall. In my case, this would be the uh, left section of the wall, and I have no cohorts here. So what happens now? If I have no cohorts here, I have to calculate how many Picked attacks went through my protection, so in this case one, because I have one card and I couldn't protect myself against this, and you can get one disdain maximum during this year, and this is what I will get. This is one disdain that I will get, I would have to circle this. If you defend yourself against all of the cards during a year, so for example I had this filled, and this would be one card protected from, I would get one valor for protecting myself. What happens if there are more cards and we are further down the line in the year? For example, let's say that we are on hard difficulty on year two and we would have to draw three cards and all of those cards are attacking me on the left side. So if, for example, I have three cards, they all attack me on the left side 
I would get maximum two disdain, no matter that three of them were uh, kind of let through, three attacks, but I can get a maximum of two disdain on the second year. And the same, if I protected myself against all of those, I would get only maximum two valor. If you protect yourself against only a part of those cards, so for example, I had two areas filled in here, I would protect myself against those two. One would go through, so I would get one Valor and one Disdain. So you deduce the number of the uh, cards you that went through the wall from this uh, number in the gray flag here, and this is what you get. And this is every year for every player. Each player defends themselves from the same uh, set of cards. And now here are those circular icons from the uh, temples and the diplomats that come into play. If, let's reset for the first year, I for example had this situation and I have no protection here on the first year, I would be able, for example, to blank this that I've purchased in the temple, if I did this, because this is a pure hypothetical, because I don't have it built and everything, and I would be able to remove this card. And I would be protected, I would get this valor and everything would be okay. And the same goes for the diplomats, but remember that they work directionally, so they protect only their own section of the wall. And if you are playing a one or two player game, there is a one little addition. Remember that when you use those extra cards, not cards owned by players or yours, you want to purchase this symbol or the trade good from this card, you have to place the resource on this card, right? So whenever you do that, during the attack of the Picts, for every resource or every soldier or every anything else, for every wooden piece on those cards, you draw an additional attack card. And this is the only difference. And then the play continues on. So you draw a new card and you distribute the resources for every player according to the symbols here. You uh, add on the resource production and the hotels and the workshops and the roads. If you have any filled, you complete the resources. You take the two cards, you decide which one goes as your uh, end goal and which one goes here and covers this one and you continue with the game filling in more spaces etc etc and that's how you go until year six ends and the last attack is defended from and then you get victory points and now with victory points this is pretty easy you get the victory points from each of those tracks depending on your level on this track so you check where you are, you check the number on the flag, you put it here, and you get victory points for those four tracks. You get victory points for each of those cards that you have here. So you will get victory points for those six conditions, and they are also explained here. So for example, I've got finished uh, guard, wall guard sections. So this is one section of the wall guard, this is the second one, this is the third one. If I've reached the third one and the last space was filled, I would get three filled sections that would be three victory points. And I would add three here, and then for other cards I would also add it here. Then you calculate the disdain that's left, so any spaces that are circled but not filled in. If you've got one, you get minus one point, two give you minus three points, three give you minus five, etc, etc. You tally it up, and this is your total result. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope that everything now is very clear on how to play Hadrian's Wall. This is a great resource and write game, because uh, it's not a roll and write, it's a, uh, you don't roll anything here, so I don't know how, to, how else to call it. I like it very much. I hope you liked this video. I hope it was very helpful. Once again, if you liked it, click the like button, hit the subscribe, uh, ring the notification bell, leave a trace in the comments. If you have any questions, ask away. I will try to help and answer as much as I can. See you in others of my videos. Stay tuned. My name is Lone Vic. This was Hadrian's Wall. Bye bye.